I'm Jim Thieler. I'm a senior research associate at the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center, retired from UWL faculty, and uh, today we would like to talk about use of bones by Native American folks uh, to make various artifacts. Uh, we'll be looking at the use of turtles, uh, mammal bones, particularly large mammals, uh, bird bones, various uses of antler. Check the description box for timestamps. White-tailed deer, deer are important animals in Native American societies as food animals, as clothing, uh, and white-tailed deer males carry antlers, which they develop during the summer and the very early fall, and these are part of the development for uh, uh, the rut during mating season when bucks compete with each other for females. Uh, and uh, native people certainly made lots of use of the antlers. Uh, and this is a white-tailed deer with a small set of antlers. And uh, uh, these are attached very tightly. And then about the end of January, the 1st of February, the antlers fall off. And will regrow the next year if the deer survives through the through the winter and spring. Uh, we can tell after they drop, the antlers drop off, they have a very distinct pattern on this antler. It's someone sawed off part of to use for, for uh, the artifact display here. Um, but there's a very distinct uh, part of the antler here, the pedicle. And when we end up with skulls with a pedicle scar, we can tell them, get some seasonality out of the deer skulls, male deer skulls, whether they have carry antlers or not. Uh, in the lacrosse area, the late, later folks who lived here in, in, in ancient times uh, commonly picked up, harvested, dropped antlers. Much as people hunt for dropped antlers today, you can see this one was not attached to the skull. And... Uh, uh, this one was found at a local archaeological site, and the, the tips of these have been removed, again, to be used for tools. Sometimes this is done by the groove and snap technique, where a groove is cut around with a flint object and then snapped off. But they also groove these or score these with hot embers. We'll see burn spots on these, and this allows them to snap them off more easily. The antler is very tough, durable material. So we have antlers that were dropped and left. This is a white-tailed deer antler, and this is an antler uh, from, a, from an elk. And again, you can see the, the, the pedicle back here, and this was, it has every point removed on it. And this specimen also has uh, a, a, a pair of grooves up here where they were carefully grooving this so they could remove this strip and modify this strip into an artifact and wool. We'll, Talk about that next. We briefly looked at this elk antler before, and it has two very large, deep grooves that were cut or scored in, probably with a flint tool, along here to remove a long strip. And from these strips, they take and, and make various artifacts, particularly things that are bands or or. Uh, pendants, uh, and they're ground down very thin, so just the exterior part is left. And I have read that some Native American groups would take these strips once they're ground down and boil them at a low temperature and bend them very slowly. These are all made of antler, and their exact function is unknown. See grinding striations in the, in the interior. Cut marks along the edge, which we commonly call tally marks, so we're not sure what these represent. And sometimes we get complete bands or artifacts like this, which are very interesting. It may have been uh, an armband. They have a perfor this one has a perforation at each end, uh, and maybe some other function. We're not really certain. But but the use of antler was was uh, quite important in, in native societies. We also have other kinds of objects, such as these, these, these pen-type objects or 
uh, sometimes referred to as flint napping tools or gaming pieces. They're rounded at each end, they're smoothed down and polished. Their function is unknown as far as I, I know. Uh, another use for antler, again, we're, we're out of the ornamental zone here. Uh, and this is a, a har small harpoon head. Uh, it's blackened because it was burned, but this is cut out of antler and, and would have been very functional as part of a uh, harpoon or a lyster for harvesting fish. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about use of white-tailed deer bones for projectile points. Uh, I'm going to start with the toe and move to the head. Uh, this is a third phalanx of a white-tailed deer within its carotene sheath. This is a material a lot like your fingernail. And uh, you can see the bone here. These, these come out pretty easily when, the, when, the, when they're dried. And this is what a third phalanx looks like, a very distinct white-tailed deer bone. You can see it's kind of an irregular bone. And uh, these were frequently converted to projectile points uh, at our sites in the lacrosse area. This is a third phalanx that has had the, the, the end carefully ground off, the point carefully ground, and then a nice square socket groove put in here so, so a, a arrow shaft could be inserted in there. This is to be an excellent projectile point, again, working from uh, 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 kind of an irregular bone to really a beautiful triangular projectile point. White-tailed deer antlers were also commonly used. The tips of white-tailed deer antlers were taken and cut and grooved. And this could be snapped off, the groove and snap technique as it's called. The point could be carefully ground to a sharp point and then a socket, be, uh, a perforation be drilled in here. You can literally insert an arrow shaft in this and you have a very nice, effective projectile point. Here's a very delicate, fine one made out of a projectile point tip. And it still can see the, the drilling marks very neatly in this uh, projectile point made out of a white-tailed deer antler tip. As I've noted before, white-tailed deer is an essential, important animal. It's a food animal, a source of clothing, and certainly a source of bone for tools. Um, I have here a, a white-tailed deer mandible, or jawbone, and uh, when we find these on archaeological sites, they are consistently broken open. And one of the reasons they're broken open is they break off this lower part or inferior border, and there's a very high quality bone marrow in there. Uh, some northern tribes have talked about the quality of bone marrow and mandibles being excellent. Uh, I haven't tried them, but uh, I, I believe that it probably is the case. These mandibles, once they have been uh, broken open, are sometimes used as tools in the, our Oneota sites in the lacrosse area. We often find mandibles such as this one and uh, they have a, a, the inferior border is broken off and they have smooth margins. Uh, these have been called deer jaw sickles and uh, presumably for perhaps cutting uh, vegetation of some type such as prairie grasses. Uh, our experiments show that they may not be sickles at all but they may in fact be scrapers. They don't seem to function well uh, for cutting prairie grasses. This margin is often polished and worn. Sometimes this, this front part is polished and worn and again it just shows the nice free use of these tools. And we have found these tools in caches of several individuals uh, that were, were stored away for a future date and not recovered. We like to talk about bone awls today. These are one of the artifacts we find on Native American sites in the La Crosse area. Uh, awls are basically perforating tools used to work leather, sometimes perhaps other things such as basketry. Uh, what I have in my hand here is a splinter bone awl. 
And splinter bone awls are created by splintering long bones of mammals. This is a white-tailed deer rear leg, a tibia. And we find remains of white-tailed deer on most of our archaeological sites, but we don't find complete bones. Bones are typically broken open to extract the bone marrow. Or Fat-rich, nutrient-rich bone marrow is never passed up at these in these archaeological sites, and uh, this results in lots of bone splinters. And bone splinters are primarily are, are sometimes used as uh, modified and used as awls. Awls are splinters often that are ground and sharpened, and uh, serve very well as perforating tools. Uh, we think the primary footgear and perhaps the primary clothing of Native Americans in ancient times was hides of white-tailed deer, hides of elk, uh, and perhaps some other animals, but there's lots of leather working going on, and uh, we find these nicely produced sharp pointed awls often have a, a luster on them uh, from, from, from repeated use and perforation. We have a, a few awls here. This is an, uh, uh, an awl very similar to this one. It's a, a mammal long bone splinter. This is from a bison scapula hoe fragment. Scapula hoes break apart after they're used for a while, and these awls are, uh, these fragments are often re, uh, made and converted into awls or other tools. Uh, we have scapula fragments and also this is a bird bone, a large bird and this bird was, bone is fragmented and then they ground a very sharp fine point. Bird bone is very dense and uh, produces a very nice sharp point for an awl. We have other bones on the animal such as this ulna from a white-tailed deer and these are, already have kind of a handle on them. And these are commonly converted to awls, such as this, this ulna awl that you see here, white-tailed deer ulna awl. And uh, these have a nice polish and luster on this one. This is probably used for a very long time. And uh, as I, I've seen some of these worn down and polished to the point where you think they might have been passed down from generation to generation. Uh, this is a elk ulna, and elk ulnas were also converted into elk ulna awls. And uh, you can maybe see how this is, and it produces an ulna with a very nice handle for perforating leather. Native American peoples made tremendous use of animal resources, and particularly bones of animals. And today I want to mention uh, the American beaver. This is the American beaver jaw or mandible. Uh, it has this prominent tooth in the front and uh, this, this uh, incisor is very good chisel. It's well known as a woodworking tool among the beaver community. And when we find these jaw bones or mandibles on archaeological sites, uh, they typically look exactly like this one. This incisor's been removed, and sometimes they're cut out, sometimes they can be worked out when they're moist, uh, but they are clearly wanted as tools. Uh, we find them carefully ground and worked, such as this example, very distinct because of the color. A nice chisel margin put on, the inside's been cut down, and these were probably mounted some way and used in a scraping motion or cutting motion, we presume, for woodworking. Uh, my theory is that these teeth were uh, dry out and become very fragile, but I think they were kept moist somehow during their use, and uh, that kept their resilience and their quality intact. Native American people has used animals of many kinds in many ways, and we want to just mention our, our friend the turtle. It's an important animal in the landscape, and uh, these were uh, playing a, a number of roles, but they're an important food source. 
some situations. Um, snapping turtles were commonly consumed, soft shell turtles commonly consumed, and sometimes map turtles. And I have a map turtle here today, and we see we have an upper shell, uh, a carapace, and a bottom shell, plastron, and we can cut along here, tap along here after the animal's deceased and remove that shell and get at the uh, soft tissues inside, mostly the leg bones and neck and perhaps some organ meat. When you get done with it, you have an empty shell, such as this map turtle, and uh, uh, you have the vertebral column still in the bottom, Attached to the shell, really the shell, the plaster, uh, carapace, uh, rather, is uh, really modified ribs. And uh, so we have this uh, nice vertebral column. If we clean that out, if we grind it out, we can make a nice container. And here is a map turtle container. And you can see the vertebral column is gone. It's been ground off and smoothed off here. And we see this in a number of species of turtles, uh, perhaps more commonly in Blanding's turtles and where they occur, uh, pain, uh, uh, box turtles, but we do see it in other turtles too. So this is the case where, you know, maximum use, use the shell, eat the tissue of these nice animals. Bird bones an amazing material. It was often converted into artifacts and ornaments. This is a bird bone awl that we have uh, looked at before, but it's hollow, thin, and bird bone is very dense, hollow and light for the adaptation to bird flight. And uh, we find artifacts made of bird bone and sometimes uh, very interesting artifacts. We have a, a flute here or a whistle and this is made out of a, a, a wing bone, a humerus, of a Canada goose is the closest match we have. A Canada goose from the Mississippi River. And uh, this, you can see where this was cut off, both ends. It's engraved. It has a, a, a stop here. Uh, and uh, uh, occasionally bird bones are converted into beads. And we have a bird bone bead here, and we can see it's cut and snapped on both ends, and then can be polished and used as a ornamental. Want to mention another type of bone artifact. This is a particular kind of artifact we believe is a musical instrument. We call these bone rasp and they have a series of grooves cut along the edge. This is a bison rib, a very large rib, and there lines all the way down, and we believe they took a, a rod and rubbed across this to make, make a particular kind of sound. Here we have a, a perforation in the side. It's polished, we think, as a resonance uh, aperture to increase sound distribution. Uh, this specimen is quite polished and worn. We find fragments of these on archaeological sites. Here you can see some fragments. And again, these are all from archaeological context in our region. Uh, similar objects are still used today. This is a rasp from northern Mexico, uh, Tarahamara country, and simply take a rod and rub across it and produces a particular kinds of sound. And you can add a gourd under this, again, for a different kind of uh, uh, sound. And here are the sounds of a historic rasp on a gourd, how it may have been used and played. Thanks for watching today. Please check the description box for links to further information. Thank you very much.